Hi. Welcome everyone. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Jeff, do you want to do you want to start us off? Yeah, well, that's a it's a tough handoff to start. Yeah, I was just going to lead and, and add a little context here that uh, the operative phrase in uh, the operative word in our company name is the middle one. This is technology business research, and we are discussing a very complex technology topic in quantum computing. Uh, but we'll, our focus and our observations of this uh, evolving nascent market is as much to take a look at the commercial readiness and commercial interest in it as it is to get into the details of the scientific discoveries that are ongoing to get us to that commercial viability. Uh, I've been with TBR for about 10 years and have been looking at quantum computing at least part-time uh, for about the last five. Uh, but the gentleman who does the yeoman's uh, work in uh, curating our, our content on this is, is Jacob. And uh, Jacob? Hi, uh, yeah. So I'll just uh, start off by uh, briefly introduc introducing myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an analyst at TBR, um, and I am in the IT infrastructure practice. So I cover vendors such as... Um, Dell, IBM, Lenovo, and HPE, and as a part of my research, I also like to research the, the future of IT infrastructure, quantum computing, uh, and I work with, closely with Jeff on the quantum computing market landscape. Um, and so, yeah, as you guys can see, the uh, table of contents of our market landscape is, is on this slide, and it it shows uh, the type of content that we, we curate uh, in the report, and we try to take a macro view of the industry and analyze the, the trends, uh, as well as vendor strategy and, and general developments. Um, it's essentially our, our attempt to boil the ocean, so to speak, in this quickly moving uh, industry. Um, and so if any of you are interested, uh, feel free to contact me or Jeff or Haley. Um, to inquire further. Um, and uh, with that, I, I think we should get started. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, first I'm going to go over uh, our agenda for today. We're going to be talking about some recent developments, uh, and then we'll go over TBR's quantum taxonomy, uh, which will lead into our quantum vendor positioning, uh, where we see vendors playing, and uh, after that, we will go into geographic activity and differentiation, uh, basically, in particular, uh, where we see uh, quantum activity and gravity. Um, and after that, we will talk about our topic of the day, post-quantum cryptography, uh, specifically what it is, why it's important, what's happening, um, and, and why it's kind of bubbled to the surface uh, as a topic to the answer the why now question. After that, uh, we'll take a look into the future um, at, you know, potential use cases and, and their timelines um, when they're expected to be available. And finally, we'll have a Q&A. So without further ado, um, okay, let's see. Oops. Yeah. So we've broken down um, the quantum developments into four categories. Uh, the first of which we have is scientific advancements, and and really what we're looking at here is um, is three of the um, you know most important uh, aspects of, of the actual quantum systems um, and and the progress in development. Uh, the first of which is scale. Um, you know, many, I'm sure many of you know that uh, in order to to achieve uh, a useful quantum computer, we're going to need uh, a lot more than just you know tens or hundreds of qubits. We're going to need uh, you know hundreds of thousands to like a million qubits, if not more, um, to be able to run the algorithms that will be uh, useful. And um, and so. Some of the most recent uh, 
developments in this regard are uh, happened last year uh, with with IBM. They they released their 127 qubit uh, processor, uh, and uh, and that's that's the largest that that we've seen for a superconducting quantum computer uh, thus far. Uh, and then next on the list that's closest to them is probably Rigetti with their uh, 80 qubit QPU, uh, which deployed a, a multi-chip um, architecture, um, which combined two 40 qubit um, processors. Um, next, the next dimension of quantum computing that we want to touch on is, is quality. Uh, quality is obviously very important. Um, you, I mean, while scale is also important, uh, if you have you know a million qubits that don't give you the right answer, then uh, they're going to be useless. So quality is extremely important. Um, specifically, the qubit fidelity um, is is necessary. Um, is you know we need to improve the qubit fidelity across the board um, to achieve you know what we want to. And uh, the last one is speed. It's not really a subject that is talked about very often, but it's it's you know equally important to, to the other three because um, you know what the the value that quantum computers ultimately will bring is um, you know speed in, in certain calculations and and so if you have a computer that is you know that is accurate but it takes a long time then it kind of defeats the purpose or it, at least it um, holds back the, the potential of the systems and and uh, and there IBM also uh, kind of proposed a new a new metric uh, circuit layer operations per second or, or clops um, so you know analysts can can kind of um, can you know Compare compare different systems because there are so many um, different types of architectures that are very difficult to um, to compare directly. So that's one way of, of doing that. Um, the next the next bucket of developments we've uh, we've laid out are our investments. Uh, over the past two years, there have been um, a lot of there's been a lot of investment activity. Um, I mean just just going over the, the top seven startups uh, throughout their lifetime, uh, 2.7 billion dollars have been invested uh, into these these seven startups um, over their lifetime, but the majority of which uh, was invested in the last couple of years. So there's a massive amount of money flowing into into quantum computing, and uh, and that that doesn't even uh, include the the hyperscalers like. Um, AWS and um, IBM and Google and Microsoft, uh, which have their own internal um, quantum development teams and uh, which are funded by their, you know, large R&D uh, budgets. Um, but recently, in, in 2022, the, you know, all these companies that I've I've mentioned are quantum hardware vendors. Um, they're you know they're using this money to develop the actual systems and uh in 2022 we've actually seen a shift in in where uh venture capitalists are, are starting to put their money um and and the major shift is from hardware into uh software companies so companies like sandbox aq uh which was actually a spin-off uh of google uh they started a Quantum, an AI company um, that raised like a, a, an undisclosed but nine-figure uh, investment. You have Terra Quantum and Classic, both um, software companies that uh, received 60 and 30 million dollars respectively. Um, so we're starting to see uh, uh, venture capitalists and, and other investors, private equity, uh, start to invest in um, in software vendors at higher free frequency, but uh, ultimately lower sums as uh, the reason that we've seen so much money in, in hardware vendors is because it, it takes a massive amount of capital to 
to to fund these projects um, over over a long period of time. Um, and with alliances, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, on the on the alliances side, I, one of the first things that I believe needs to be heavily stressed when taking a look at the the quantum segment of the industry writ large is really that no single firm can do all of it. Uh, IBM is the closest in, in, in doing that by virtue of their early investments in quantum going back well over a decade, and they do have more of the systems and then their connection into their services files. But it really requires um, a lot of collaboration. And some of the interesting ones, I, if we list IBM and Continuum up there, because if you think of the leaders in competing system architectures of superconducting an ion trap, IBM's a, 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 a leader in the superconducting, and Continuum is one of several that are very strong, if not the strongest, in ion Q. I'm sorry, in ion trap, ion Q being one of the ion trap vendors. And these two have, have joined forces. IBM has some investment in Continuum, which is the joint venture between Honeywell and their quantum assets and then Cambridge Quantum Computing over in the UK. So that's a very interesting one to us in terms of even the early leaders in the system uh, race, uh, as opposed to software and algorithms, are, are likewise joining forces. And then we have EY and IBM who have uh, become very, very tight. I mean, a lot of the uh, advisory services firms are not necessarily dedicated or working. They're, they're not doing research to innovate around systems, but they are uh, working with the software layers that are powered by these to translate it into business uh, use cases. So that is one that was very interesting to us, as well as an EY, uh, I believe it was only UK customer study at the uh, rising uh, visibility interest, board level interest in uh, what is going on. World Fund and IQM, IQM is a, a small superconducting uh, I don't know if I should call them a startup based, uh, Finnish based. Uh, they uh, have very strong interest by the European Union. When you look at the political implications of what quantum is, given the security issues around uh, post quantum cryptography, as well as the economic activity uh, that many anticipate quantum will generate for those nations that have centers of gravity within their, their borders around this. Uh, so World Fund has also uh, invested in IQM. I believe uh, the most recent press release I said saw had them now uh, in unicorn uh, uh, levels of about a billion dollars. Uh, and then the last thing is the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST. That's a U.S.-based government agency uh, on the PQC. Teaming, we'll get into that a little bit more, but the number of rounds of submissions, they come from academia, industry, government agencies. So it's, it's a, it's, it is a very broad collaborative effort to try to determine what post-quantum cryptography is going to look like. And then the other interest here, obviously, customer adoption. As I stated with, out of that EY uh, study from, uh, again, I think it was UK-based, uh, it's gaining boardroom attention, so they're they're putting markers down now. Boardroom attention, and also calibrated expectations about how long it will take before there's going to be tangible business value. That's one of the things some of the folks uh, who are working on this wince a little bit over the boardroom attention because the the expectations may be uh, slightly narrower. Um, or uh, uh, they expect it faster than the experts believe they can deliver, I guess is the way I should say that. You have the big four uh, evangelism in terms of where they think it can be used. We, various services, industries, uh, services elements, what they have or what they call the quantum ambassadors. So they, are in, they have the industry expertise to be able to tell 
their business leaders what it is they believe quantum will be able to do for them when uh, it finally is achieved to generate the interest. And then they can turn it over to the deep quantum expert in the event those those customers in those narrow industries are, are looking um, want to pick it up. Now, there's been a standard set of, of use cases that have been um, uh, articulated almost universally uh, within the quantum industry for the for as long as I've been covering it in terms of uh, chemical scientific modeling, uh, root optimization, uh, financial uh, 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 econometric modeling, et cetera, et cetera. What I was hearing in this last round of research that is heartening to me are additional use cases that haven't been out there. I listened to a, a head of strategy for an advertising agency, for example, talking about their use for it. We hadn't heard of those uh, before. And what it really is, is the anticipation of being able to join uh, AI and, and quantum together in various different ways to speed up the time to insight as well as broaden the depth of the analysis that you can simulate. And the reason for this, the fundamental difference from classical and quantum, it isn't necessarily the size of the data set that you can analyze. It's the breadth of different variables, the number of variables that you can compare simultaneously. That really is the big shift that uh, that, that quantum provides. And that is uh, why for chemical modeling, uh, for healthcare, uh, I, another, I don't want to, it, it's tied to science, but the, the idea of decarbonization, climate impact, the ability that this will be able to use. We had some visibility from all the, all the uh, COVID uh, talk that has dominated the airwaves of how quantum would be able to assist in that as well. So that is the backdrop of the development. Now, before we get into who's who at the zoo and the vendor positioning, what I'd like to do is just quickly go through the taxonomy that TBR uses in order to be able to try to position and calibrate vendors. It's uh, instead of a two by two, those little icons we call more of a Tetris. Uh, and it's designed that way also because we look at quantum as what we call a step function increase. It, once it is commercially viable, which is seven years away, somewhere around there, somewhere in 2030, the 2030s, it should have very impactful commercial use cases. Now, if you look at this, it, 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 the IT skills development, that is starting to increase, and academia is also getting involved in there to, to establish quantum curricula, quantum curricula. Right now, I, I, I was um, lucky enough to uh, uh, audit a, 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 a webinar event that IBM sponsored last year around education for quantum, and the idea was there re really isn't a, a a uh, quantum native degree. It's it's typically a bit of math. It's typically a bit of physics. So academia has figured out that they need to develop quantum tracks. There's also the education and training of, of existing programmers and developers. There's also the integration. It's 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 a it's it's a hybrid technology stack that will be generating business value and it's got to connect into classical. So you've got this legacy pool of labor that needs the training and the, and the uh, uh, it, it skills and enhancements in order to take advantage of that. There's the software libraries and tools to simplify it so that the, I don't want to call it a citizen developer, but a classical developer can take advantage of it. So that's a very key, important layer, and it's kind of the bridge between the old and the new. To the right of that is what we call the application discovery. That's truly the the, uh, the advisory-led uh, education and exploration of where quantum can be applied for business value. It's the, it's the ability to translate the two. 
it's the C-suite and the line of business sort of level of interaction to determine what they can do. And it's also got the regulatory and compliance elements, which when you think about data privacy, when you think about cybersecurity and post quantum cryptography is sort of the education between the, the money uh, people in the business and the technical people. Bottom row is, is all the, the hard work that's been ongoing in terms of just scientific discovery. So there's the systems innovation, how many qubits, how accurate are the qubits, what's the fidelity, et cetera, et cetera, to make them commercial grade. That's really sort of the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is the virtualization of the circuits. It's the redesign of how the circuitry works, a, a breakthrough we, we covered in the prior version that IBM had mentioned was uh, you know, variational circuits. So that sort of an if-then within the, the uh, instruction set such that you didn't have to run it once, bring it back after the result of the if-then and run it again. So some of the speed that's picking up is as much in the software tuning as it is in the, in the uh, qubit uh, count and fidelity. So with that as a backdrop, we'll put up the massive messy slide uh, of the vendors and where we position them. And, and the first thing I want to state is up and to the right is not necessarily uh, a lot of sort of competing vendors uh, have up and to the right as the, as the biggest and most important element. It really isn't here. Uh, and the, the point I'll make is we, we shifted a couple, Continuum and Capgemini being some of them. And part of the reason we shifted them up a little bit is their, their alliance activity with IBM for access to the, to the IBM ecosystem. It's kind of drawing them up. Uh, and it could very well be 15 years from now, 10 years from now, that ion trap and superconducting systems are looked at like the Stanley Steam, Steamer automobile. It, it's too early to tell. But for now, uh, you know, clearly IBM has the lead on the system side, but they also have the breadth of that ecosystem, and they're sort of drawing uh, the others up. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, take a pause other than clearing the slide in, in the situation. You see the bottom in the light blue, is that supply side innovation. That's the heart of the hardware, the system and the, and the system run times and the, and the basic, uh, you know, close to the qubit uh, uh, software calls. The dark, the dark blue is more the, the business layer, uh, the translation and the plugging into the classical as well as the uh, uh, ability to translate that into the business uh, use case application. And with that, uh, Jacob, I, I know you wanted to comment here, and then I can come back if there's pieces that I feel need to be added as yeah. well. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on some of the vendors specifically, um, most of the system vendors. Um, yeah, as you can see, IBM, top right, we talked about them a decent amount. They just have a very holistic, uh, a very, yeah, holistic um, portfolio from their hardware to their software and, and Kiskit and um, and their services. They have IBM Consulting and and they've um, been leaders in in kind of quantum education um, and evangelism of, of quantum computing. So uh, then just below them we have Quantinuum. Um, Honestly, we don't necessarily see, we see them as uh, pretty equal in terms of uh, system innovation. They they could you know it could be argued that their systems are um, you know are are better or competitive. Um, although it's it's almost impossible to compare just considering that uh, Quantinium is is uh, using a an ion trap. Uh, architecture rather than a super nothing architecture. So it's kind of a meaningless, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exercise to, to compare the two. But Continuum's, uh, you know, achieved quantum volume on their, um, on their latest model, uh, system model H2, uh, H12. Um, they've achieved industry leading quantum volume. So that just speaks to um, the quality of their of their systems, um, 
and on you know various other benchmarks such as uh, you know application oriented benchmarks they've also scored very very well there so uh, we see them um, doing very well and um, in terms of their portfolio they they you know they have software now that uh, they merged with uh, Cambridge Quantum and um, and in terms of services, they're they're a bit behind IBM because of um, IBM's um, internal consulting as well as their partnerships and, and whatnot. But um, and then kind of the next tranche of of hardware vendors, we see IonQ and Rigetti. Uh, both of these are just behind the top two in, um, and competing in ion trap and, and superconducting qubit um, technologies respectively uh, both are you know they have great promise and and uh, INQ just introduced a 32 qubit uh, ion trap system and Rigetti uh, has their multi-chip processor um, you know which is a critical step in, in scalability so um, they're both also well on their way in development um, Behind them, we kind of have a third tranche of, of vendors, uh, which are, you know, kind of dark horses of, of the industry, so to speak. And so we have Psi Quantum, which is, you know, one of the top two funded quantum system uh, startups uh, in the industry. I mean, they've raised, uh, you know, two monster venture capital rounds, and one of which, their first one was uh, 200 million. Plus, and their second was also north of uh, 400 million. So, yeah, they're pursuing photonics, but they have not released very much uh, public information on their system. So, um, yeah, there's there's not really much to report on there. Uh, Xanadu and IQM are also very interesting um, quantum startups. Uh, Xanadu is also very well funded. I mean, both these firms are very well funded. They both have uh, have gotten nine-figure venture capital uh, funding rounds. Uh, Xanadu being a uh, being in contention with Psi Quantum in, in photonics and IQM um, competing uh, with you know IBM and Rigetti in terms of uh, the superconducting architecture. So um, and finally, there's kind of a, a last group. Uh, which are the hyperscalers, um, Google, AWS, and Microsoft. Um, they're also in the running, as, as Jeff said, they're trying to also infuse their uh, quantum capabilities into their you know, cloud platforms and, and data centers. Um, so it, it's been a logical step for them to pursue this technology as well. Um, and as, but aside from Google, these companies have um, mostly been in, embedded in academic research uh, in quantum computing and um, but you know what makes them you know serious contenders and um, is just the gravity of their cloud platforms I mean they they all have a uh, third-party quantum system um, vendor provisioning they all um, are partnering with all these other uh, quantum vendors because they have the scale of the cloud to um, to basically allow customers to, to use the early um, iterations of their systems. So, uh, and then as well as their, their large R&D budgets, um, you know, will allow them to um, accelerate development and uh, compete for, for top tier talent. Um, Jeff, is there anything else you want to add there or um, should, we, should we move sure. on? Sure. Sure. Uh, a couple of a couple of points is uh, you'll you'll see uh, say Nokia Bell Labs uh, where we have them somewhat near the bottom. Now that isn't they they're relatively quiet about their activity. Uh, it's also likely more for quantum networking. Uh, this is you know don't count them out. This is the point that I was trying to make that a, a, a scientific discovery could leapfrog one of the competing system architectures. Uh, 
seemingly overnight. And you have the same thing with uh, with Microsoft and Google. Microsoft is is working the topological angle, which uh, uh, could someday uh, leapfrog as well. Google is working heavily on, on semiconductors. I'm sorry, on superconducting. Um, and we, we, I struggle with the annealing. I, I see their immediate value. I see the immediate value for the education and training and the exploration and kind of use case testing. But long term, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical when it comes to do you use annealing when you have a, a fault tolerant uh, quantum uh, system available? So that's sort of the, the challenge we have with the annealers. They, they do serve an immediate short term need in the, in the, in the, in the space. Uh, that would be uh, primarily the, the D wave Fujitsu and Atos are, are, are working that angle. Atos, I forgot to mention earlier, is also allied with IQM. So they do have the access to the supercomputing is, is kind of a European Union uh, best in class. Uh, when I was studying in, in college, it was called champion industry uh, focus of, uh, of the EU. The other piece is all the, we know it's going to be a hybrid world. That's part of the value why AWS, Microsoft, Google offer the ability to get up and on the systems. It's what IBM uh, has as a hope that uh, wherever your strategic apps go, you're going to pull that, that commodity infrastructure uh, as a service compute probably to where your strategic apps are. So I would I haven't heard it from IBM, but I would assume for IBM the hope is that they can repatriate some of the lost share that the from the big three if, as they have the best in class lead. You have QCware that has a similar kind of play in terms of almost like a cloud to determine what other cloud to go to in terms of you submit the you submit the the work request, they match the algorithm to the system best optimized for it, and then they sort of fire it out almost like a, a two-stop airline flight rather than a one out to the cloud and back. Uh, so that's just a little bit of the, of the other pieces of color. Every, every vendor gets all fixated on their positioning on a two-by-two. Two. And the, you know, the first thing I, I keep seeking to caution is, up and to the right isn't necessarily the best. You could have the great best system, or you could have the best advisory, or you could have the best sort of algorithm package and routing mechanism to marry the algorithm to the right type of system, which would be more to the left-hand side, kind of middle left. And middle left is where I think you're going to see a lot of the M&A work, a lot of the consolidation and, and alliances going on. Uh, Jacob? Yeah, okay, uh, so we can move on to the next slide. So for the Americas, the vast majority of um, the activity is happening in the US. There is some activity happening in Canada as well, but um, I mean, the, U the US uh, has the most gravity for, for you know multiple reasons. The, gov the US government, um, efforts, you know, they revolve around industry standards um, with, you know, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, also known as NIST, um, which we'll talk about more later. In addition, you know, other <clears throat> agency investments around uh, defense and national security. Um, and more broadly, the private sector is also um, multiple startups and, and leading established vendors. Um, which are competing for uh, commercialization of, of quantum systems. Um, the National Quantum Initiative uh, Advisory Committee consists of 22 experts and, and they meet uh, semi-annually to kind of uh, review the, the program's impact and, and its um, impact on, on U.S. leadership and um, in the nation, and so, um, and then obviously the there's uh, just the gravity of of Silicon Valley. Um, 
you know, there's tons of investment from various venture capital firms and um, and we've seen uh, companies such as Psy Quantum, which were, you know, uh, initially, I think, UK based, but they um, relocated to Silicon Valley because of, of the, um, the investment. So the U.S. is drawing a lot of, uh, of companies and, and it's already starting to um, create a vacuum of talent uh, into the country. So. Uh, next, we're looking at APAC. China is the, is the nation that, that received most attention. They dwarf uh, their competitors, Japan and South Korea, in, in uh, quantum investment. Uh, and it's reported that China's committed $10 billion into, into quantum technologies, which include um, quantum computing, but also quantum networking and, and quantum sensing. Um, other quantum techno technologies that uh, are being developed in parallel. Um, yeah, in the past year, the Institute of Science and Technology of China uh, came out with uh, three papers that kind of highlighted the country's, um, you know, progress uh, in development. And one of them was was a quote on quote, quantum supremacy study, which was, you know, which should be taken with a, a, a large grain of salt, similar to the, the one that Google conducted in 2019. Um, another paper was on um, innovation in, in uh, photonic quantum systems. Um, and then the third was in quantum uh, communications. So outside of China, though, Japan has invested uh, 270 million over a 10 year period. Um, and they've taken a leadership position in development um, by becoming uh, a, a, a quantum hub for IBM. Um, there's a uh, IBM Quantum System 1 in Kawasaki City, just outside of Tokyo. Um, and so they uh, now, you know, that region has access to um, IBM's latest quantum systems for um, for testing and, and education uh, to develop talent. Um, another APAC nation that made uh, you know similar similar steps to Japan was South Korea, which invested 40 million over five years, which is fairly insignificant, but uh, it's a starting point. And they also have a quantum system one from, from IBM. Um, Jeff, you want to talk about yeah. Europe? Yeah, uh, shoot. Sure, thanks. Uh, when Jacob and I were reviewing the deck, we, we flipped uh, APAC in Europe. Uh, because if you, if you look at that, Europe has been looking up at the US and Asia uh, in the classical technology uh, economy. And the general consensus is that they, they lost out to the U.S., Intel in specific, and to Asia with the volume manufacturing. And they don't want to see that happen with this new wave of quantum. So as I mentioned, the EU champion industry, that to me is the, the Atos IQM alliance with a lot of EU backing. And then alternatively, what you have, the, you know, the other major system integrator advisory firm, uh, European-based, is Capgemini, and they have uh, aligned with IBM and the IBM Quantum Network and Quantum Hub. So there's a, a term I first heard from a, a European individual we were inter interviewing uh, about three years ago on, on, on quantum of uh, the rise of what they call techno-nationalism. I think it's a great term. I haven't seen it used much, but I, I do believe in it. It's, it's uh, a, a uh, uh, U.S.-based big four uh, managing partner of the public sector several years ago said it to me is the uh, likelihood of the balkanization of the Internet, which gets into the need for sort of a security dome by sovereign border, given so much of our economic activity is now uh, coursing through uh, the Internet or through digitally transformed systems. 
but you have that component of it. You clearly have the military use case applications. This is where ion trap systems uh, that do not have to be sort of general purpose or at scale for things like uh, self-guided GPS uh, rather than having to have a connection to kind of a, a you know, a, a ground station in order to continue moving. There's a lot of different sort of military applications for quantum. There is the cybersecurity layer uh, for quantum. And there's this sort of national interest slash suspicion of other nations as to what is going on uh, that both accelerates the interest and in some ways might impede it in terms of what alliances can happen or what uh, uh, IP is going to be shared in the collaborative effort of everybody coming together to move the, uh, the technology itself uh, forward. So uh, there's lots of activity in Europe. There's lots of you know bets being placed. There's pockets of excellence in, in Germany, in the Netherlands. Uh, the UK has a lot of investment in it as well. Uh, uh, but it's in some ways dwarfed by the sort of uh, private investment just sort of moving both in, in Asia as well as in the United States. But that that whole sense of techno-nationalism is, is kind of a nice uh, transition over to the post-quantum cryptography and those developments, which is on the next slide, and uh, uh, Jacob will uh, start. Yeah, so to talk about post-quantum cryptography, we need to talk about, you know, the standard before it, uh, the current standard for cryptography, which is um, currently the standard for encrypting digital communications is using a method called RSA encryption. And this cryptographic algorithm, algorithm is essentially a math problem that requires one to come up with um, two correct prime factors of a very large number and simply put classical computers based on bit uh, technology that we're using today on our computers that we use for this webinar for to listen in um, they can't feasibly do this even even supercomputers um, are not you know able to to decrypt rsa encryption so however um quantum computers will theoretically be able to decrypt rsa encryption and relatively easily. Um, back in 1994, Peter Shor, uh, professor of mathematics at MIT, developed an algorithm called Shor's algorithm to be uh, run on a theoretical quantum computer that can easily factor numbers um, and exponentially faster than, than classical computers using the unique properties of quantum computers such as entanglement, superposition, and interference. So with the development of, of quantum computers, um, you know, in recent years, um, you know, eventually Shor's al algorithm will be able to, to run on these computers, um, even though we can't today. And, and so, you know, that, that kind of begs the question, why should we care today if, um, you know, the encryption can't be broken and if, uh, Shor's algorithm can't be run on quantum computers right now. Um, well, uh, bad actors today are using an attack called store now and decrypt later. So they'll essentially just uh, steal encrypted data, which would be useless uh, if there wasn't the threat of, of quantum computers in the future. And they're essentially just waiting on uh, quantum computers to, to catch up and uh, be able to run Shor's algorithm so they can access that, um, that information. And so that's essentially at the core of the issue and the reason that post-quantum cryptography is being discussed. Um, yeah, we, so essentially we need to find a way to encrypt data now so that quantum computers in the future um, cannot, um, cannot access that information. Um, and so the U.S. Um, National Institute of Standards and Technology has been working since 2016 to 
uh, settle on post-quantum cryptographic standards. And so um, Jeff mentioned earlier there, there, there were many, you know, initial candidate submissions, uh, 82 to be exact in the first round. Um, and these, these submissions come from, you know, various academic institutions, um, you know, some private institutions as well, um, and by groups of researchers. And, um, and so, you know, over time, they've been evaluating these submissions and, and modifying them. Uh, and by the second round, that number was down to 27. And by the third round, there were only 15 left in consideration. Um, and in third round, uh, after the third round, four algorithms were selected for standardization um, with an additional four proceeding to the fourth round of evaluation. Unfortunately, uh, I think in the past couple of weeks in, in July, one of the four um, PQC uh, candidate algorithms was um, was broken, and so that you know is a major impediment and and you know limits the uh, the already few uh, number of, of candidates to use in in PQC. Um, and yeah, Jeff, do you do you want to add anything there? Sure. This um, this really is a uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a clear long term threat long term and it is so reminiscent of Y2K to me I I was living that I was a, I was a selectman in a small town we were worried about like water supplies our 911 systems etc and so you know 19 late 98 99 we were trying to figure out if it was a problem or not. And we we're all holding our breath on New Year's Eve, wondering what was going to happen. And it was a, it was a big nothing burger. It was sort of a joke of the SI Full Employment Act. Uh, I believe quantum uh, uh, or or cracking uh, current encryption methods is going to happen, and there will be people who get hurt with it. This is a little bit different. Uh, also, the the amount of digital information we have today, rather than 22 years ago is, is considerably different. It's a different world. And I do believe there will be some uh, serious breaches. The other aspect of that is what has been, you know, stolen now to decrypt later. I first heard that terminology uh, in an in a, uh, informational interview with, a, a, with an Australian firm called Quintessence Labs. Uh, that they knew that was going on. Now, they were based in Australia. They're kind of at the intersect of our geopolitical world uh, between East and West. Uh, so they may have, you know, some inside baseball on that that I, I just don't know about. So the, the threat, it, it could be it's already been stolen and we don't even know it. Uh, and sadly, what's happening, too, in, in Industry is, is the term hybrid is losing its impact because it's used so so much. We're talking about hybrid app, you know, hybrid use of quantum and classical. We talk about a hybrid cloud. We're now talking about hybrid. Uh, I've I've heard the hybridization for PQC used two different ways. The first way meaning that certain algorithms that are accepted depending on the vectors that you're trying to secure, you may want to use one PQC algorithm versus another. So it sounds like we won't have the sort of single de facto standard, obviously not in the beginning. But the other element that, um, now, to be honest, it kind of makes my head explode trying to figure it out, is let's say you're the bank and you are, they absolutely are the probably on the, on the leading edge of, of uh, PQC adoption when it's needed. And, you know, early on, it's just setting up your, your systems to accommodate, you know, uh, something that's twice the character length of the algorithm. Um, but they're going to be interacting in a B2C way. And you, we, it's obvious you've got a consumer and a single laptop. You know, what are the breaches that could happen from, from that perspective? So, there's a lot that is going to be coming. 
from a business perspective, from an enterprise perspective, it's it's getting ready now, and it's sort of the simple things of updating all the all the applications. But you know, banks can have 20, 30, 40,000 applications running around in the app in the app portfolio, given they were sort of the first to get into it uh, back during 16-bit systems. So they they've got a lot of legacy apps. And uh, it'll. I believe there will be some high-profile smoking holes that are going to result uh, once a black hat has access to a quantum system that's able to crack some of the encryption keys on that which they uh, already uh, stored uh, and are waiting. You know, just waiting for the tech to catch up. Now, we, we've got about eight minutes left. The next slide just is uh, our pretty pictures again and our contact. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot about this one. We do need to get through this one, Jacob. Okay. So, um, yeah, so for this last slide, we wanted to show some of the anticipated uh, use cases of quantum computing um, and chart them out. Obviously, this is not... This is not a, a, an exhaustive list of, of use cases, but these are some of the more common more common um, use cases that um, we see software companies, algorithm um, development companies working on uh, and working with their customers to, to develop um, in industries. So uh, the way that this chart is set up, we, we kind of have the present, uh, horizon one, which is kind of near term, once a uh, thousand qubit um, systems are are created, then horizon two, um, and her horizon two and three, which are kind of milestones in um, in quantum system development, um, and represent when we reach, say, uh, error correcting or um, fault, you know, full fault tolerance. Uh, so. A lot of these use cases uh, revolve around uh, a few different camps of, of problems. Uh, you know, the most obvious one is optimization. Um, it's, you know, it's around, you know, portfolio optimization, supply chain optimization, route optimization. These, these are problems that uh, quantum systems are, are, you know, going to be very good at solving because, um, you know, you can take all of the possible scenarios and and um, and and you know calculate the the probabilities all at once. Um, and so that's kind of one camp of uh, one of the camps of problems that um, is going to be applicable to a, a, a variety of different um, industries. Um, you know, here we have you know the financial industry and logistics industries. Um, that are going to be using it. And then the kind of other camp, I mean, there, I'm sure there are more types of problems that uh, quantum systems are going to be able to tackle. But uh, the other major one is simulation. Um, in terms of, you know, simulating molecules for uh, material sciences to discover new materials, um, right now the the existing method is is much more uh, heuristic, where it's kind of just you know trial and error. Um, but with with uh, quantum computers, we're going to be able to simulate uh, you know mo much larger molecules than we can today. Um, and and the reason for that is that um, because the qubits are you know in a quantum state, they're going to be able to quite literally simulate um, what, uh, you know, the, the molecules that um, we're, we're trying to simulate. So, um, and there's this, uh, there's this quote by Richard Feynman that goes, nature isn't classical, damn it. If you want uh, to make a simulation of nature, you better make it uh, quantum mechanical. And that kind of uh, encapsulates how quantum systems are going to be able to um, to be used, uh, but of course there are going to be many more use cases that 
are unforeseen uh, at this moment, but um, for now, this is uh, these are the, the major camps in which uh, problems are going to be solved. So, uh, Jeff, do you want to add anything, or should we just jump into Q and A? Well, yeah, we're we're short on a time for the for the Q and A. I know Haley has a few things she wants to add. Uh, when you look at that slide, as as uh, Jacob said, those there are the lanes, and it really is the algorithm, which to me is a big mad lib, and you've got your variables, and then the use cases of the industry sectors, and what what we'll see in horizon, late horizon two, early horizon three, is clearing a backlog of what have been persistent issues. I, I am eagerly waiting to see what the science will solve for us, be it around climate, be it around uh, medical ailments and, you know, new drug discoveries. It, 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 we are at the, we're, you know, the, the sun's coming up. We're getting close. It's still dark, but dawn is coming on, on what is going to be a very new and exciting set of developments. And I, I, I can't wait. It's why it's so much fun to keep track of this. Haley? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jacob. Um, all right, folks, if um, I know we didn't have time to get to Q&A today, but if you do have questions, Jeff and Jacob's emails are on the slide now. Um, feel free to reach out to them directly or reach out to webinars at tbri.com um, with questions that you may have. Um, to, uh, a replay version of today's webcast will be available after the event and will be sent out to all of you via email. To view a list of our upcoming and past webinars, please visit tbri.com. Um, and next week on August 18th, we will be doing a webinar presented in partnership with ASAP uh, called Benchmarking Alliance Performance Through Objective Data Metrics. Um, and that link is available to register um, on the console if you're interested in that. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.